talk <laughs> about that picture. Yeah. Well, that picture was taken uh, in the back at the back of Woodruff Street house. And um, as we were both the same age, we were probably about 55 or 56 years old when that picture was taken. You look about 35 there. No, I couldn't have been 35. You remember that being taken on Woodruff Street, eh? You remember that being taken on Woodruff Street? Distinctly. Uh-huh. Um, you don't remember who took it? No. Whoever it was uh, called your father from his work to join me in the picture. That's your dad's mother and father. They were a nice old couple. And uh, your dad and I were married in Brooklyn, New York, and a couple of years later we went over to Ireland on a vacation. And they had a farm in County Down. They were a nice old couple, very easy to live with. We were home for two years. Well, your dad thought he could make a living uh, with a chicken farm, start his chicken farm. And he started a chicken farm over there, and uh, about a year later we had an accident and the whole thing went up in flames. So that decided both of us that we should come back to this country. What did uh, Grandpa Hamill do for a living? He was a pattern maker, whatever that is. Oh, he worked in the shipyard? He did it. He was a pattern maker, very nice man. She was a nice woman, too. He was a very nice man. Well, she kept a grocery store, right? They had a grocery store uh, previously, but uh, it got to be too much for her, and they sold it and bought a small farm in County Dock. He traveled back and forth to the city. He'd come home on Friday night, and he'd go back on Sunday night. He worked in the city, and she ran this little farm. She rented most of the land to neighboring farmers and just kept a little plot where she grew vegetables and things like that. So uh, when you went back to visit, was he still working in the uh, pattern making? or He was. He, he was, was, eh? He, all the time we were there, he was still working when we left came back to this country. I see. You'd guess that picture was taken uh, about 1930? When were you back there? We went back there in uh, 1923. And we came back here to this country in 1925. Well, then uh, he was in his late 50s. We he there. was in his late 50s then, would you say? Yeah. This was taken probably 15 years later than from you. Yeah. Because they looked like about in their 70s. That picture was taken when they were small, children were small. And the girl in the picture was named Sarah. And she was the only girl, two boys and Sarah. Sarah died when she was 16. <laughs> See who that is. Maybe it's. I'm trying to think of the disease that she died of. Sarah. At that time, there was no cure for it, but they can cure it today, I think. Uh, that's a very, uh, that's a very stylish picture. Obviously, taking at a photographer's studio. Yeah. It was a great tragedy to them, to them when she died. She died at 16, you say? Yeah. The boys were both older. Yeah, I think Harry so. and John? I think she was the youngest. She looks like it. Mother looks very handsome there. What was her first name? John's mother. John's mother, Anne. Anne. And the father was John? John and Anne. Yeah. I didn't know the family at that time. Did you know what area that they lived in in Belfast? What area of Belfast they lived? Oh, they lived down in the center of the city. 
downtown. Yeah. Just was her the, store downtown? Yeah. Store was downtown. You don't remember any street name that the store was on? Yeah, they lived on Mark Street. Mark Street? Wait a minute. Eliza Street. Eliza. As in Doolittle? <laughs> what were the main streets down there then? Main Street was Royal Avenue. Royal Avenue. High Street. Royal Avenue and High Street, High right Street. around down there? Those were the main streets. Uh -huh. Well, it was about a uh, 15 minutes walk from there to where their street was. Did a lot of walking in those days. When I was in Brooklyn, before I was married, I uh, was talking to a priest one time and I told him that I was going to take a week off my work because I didn't feel well. So he says, well, if you're going to take a week off, why don't you take it in the hospital? And I said, I didn't think it was a hospital case, but he persuaded me that I would have a better rest in the hospital than where I boarded. So I went into a Holy Family Hospital in Brooklyn. And one of the uh, nurses, apprentices, you know, a nurse which learning to nurse, was Rita Schaefer. Mm -hmm. And she was in my ward, for that big long ward at that time. And uh, I was surprised a couple of years later to hear that Uncle Harry was going to marry Rita Schaefer. Is that them on the right there? Yeah. Don't they look like dandies in their uh, straw hats there? And we wrote back to Uncle Harry and told him that uh, I knew Rita Schaefer. They were very much surprised. Mm -hmm. And she didn't, she couldn't recall me so many patients, you know. But I uh, remembered Rita. Mother was Irish and her father was German. Uh -huh. And uh, there was a lot of Irish girls around there at the time that would have liked to have been friends with Harry, more than friends with Harry. He was a very attractive boy and had a good sense of humor. But uh, he was standing, he, he lost her, he uh, missed a subway train one day. And another man missed the train at the same time and they got talking, it was just the two of them on the platform. And uh, this other man asked Harry if he played chess. And Harry, Harry said, yes, he liked to play chess. So this man turned out to be a brother of Rita's named Dan, Dan Schaefer. So he invited Harry around to play chess. And that's how Harry met Rita Schaefer. So uh, it was more than a surprise for all these Irish girls to know that Harry <laughs> was more than friends with Rita Schaefer, and that's how they came together. The woman on the left-hand side of Sister Lucian is uh, my mother. On Sister Lucian's left, that'd be on our right, that little woman. She died when she was 82 years old. Oh, she did not She had 11 children, of whom I am the oldest. Has uh, one, two, three, three of her daughters, and one son in the picture. There. Now that's the only picture that I know of of Jack. Also, I thought Jack, Jack and his wife are there. Jack is in behind. Yeah, behind. Jack's in behind with his wife, and, mm -hmm. that's, and that's their boy there, right? And then uh, Rosaline and Kathleen yeah. and their daughters. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about your mother. Hmm? Tell us about your mother. My mother trained to be a teacher but never taught. Is that right? Because she got married and all these children were coming. Every year almost there was a new child. So uh, she went an hour on Tuesdays and another hour on Fridays and taught singing and uh, sewing. That was the 
was the extent of her school teaching? That, that was the, that was the gist of her teaching. Did she ever teach you anything? No. So you don't know if she, she was... She probably taught me sewing and with the other kids, you know. You don't know whether she My was... My father the taught the village school. Oh, that's right. Your father was the teacher. We don't have a picture of him that I know of, do we? I don't think so, no. He was the... Uh, was he the hedge master? No. His... Uh, my mother's father was a hedge master. <laughs> They taught them behind the hedge. Explain a hedge master. And they had one boy on the lookout. He'd give the signal if there was anybody coming. Uh, he was, so, he was, most of the children, um, their education was paid for with butter and eggs and chickens. And stuff like that. Very few of them had the cash to pay privately for the education. So both sides of your uh, both sides of your family had lots of teachers in them, didn't they? Oh yeah, yeah. My uncle Pat, my mother's brother, was a Christian brother. He came out to Philadelphia and joined the Christian Brothers. And uh, my grandfather's were my mother's father was a teacher. She had two brothers teacher. Education was there go all the time. A lot of those, uh, my brother, my mother's uh, brothers, there was really no opportunity for them there. Two or three of them came out to Canada. Then Canada. Hugh was next to me. After I was out in this country for about a year, Hugh came out. And I don't know exactly what he did, but uh, after he died, other people told me that he uh, worked for some contracting firm where you, you earned more money if you took dangerous jobs. He was killed. What was his job? Construction? It, high construction. High construction. Uh, they made a mistake. and swept a crane over a wall that he was standing on and he was killed. Wonderful boy. Was he married? No. Who was next? Jack was next. Jack uh, worked in a firm in Belfast, chemical firm. And uh, he was pretty smart. And, uh, there was a mistake made one time in the firm where a large uh, quantity of uh, material was dyed the wrong color. And it would be a big, big loss to the firm. And uh, Jack began looking into the whole thing and uh, came up with some die that neutralized the mistake and it was almost the color that was originally intended. So uh, the firm was able to make an arrangement with the buyer and the whole thing was saved. So the firm offered Jack uh, a chance to go to a college where they taught chemistry, you know, to quite a degree and all oh, that sort of thing. Yeah. But he turned it down and didn't go. He didn't? Did he turn it down voluntarily? Voluntarily. Is that right? He didn't think he had enough background education. And he, uh, of course, as we saw in that other picture, was married, right? And uh, he had three kids? He had three kids, Mother? Desmond, I don't hear what you're saying. He had three kids? He had three boys. Now that, I made a mistake here. This is my brother Brian's children. 
How many kids did Jack have? Jack had three girls and one boy, and the boy died when he was young. Uh, I wonder where Jack's kids are now. Pardon? I wonder where Jack's kids are now. Well, I know where they are now. Yeah? One of them, Ethne, is uh, married in Long Island and has one girl, Moira, who was a trained nurse before she left Belfast, came out and she was a nurse in the Belfast Hospital. Excuse me, in the New York Hospital. She met a man out here who was very nice because we were at their wedding. And uh, for some reason he wanted to learn to fly an airplane. And they went up in the airplane when his tuition was nearly over, and the airplane crashed. There was a big inquiry into that, and uh, the, event, the uh, result of the inquiry was that only one tank had been filled with uh, fuel, and accidentally the other tank was not filled at all. It had no so that was a mistake of the people that were teaching them to fly. The pilot was killed and he was killed. His wife uh, employed a lawyer and took it to court and she got a million dollars. So she is still living. They had one girl, and uh, of course the girl got a very good education because the mother was uh, had the cash to cover educated. And the widow is now living in Westport County, Mayo, Ireland. Retired there, but she kept her house in Long Island in case. She wouldn't want to live the rest of her life there. So that's as far as I know what happened to Moira. Who came after Jack? Roger. Well, why don't you talk about Brian since we got <laughs> his kids up there? And Brian came after Roger. Oh, well, Roger is the Roger from New York, right? He married Cassie. Married Cassie. He went to Canada to my uncle's in the first place, and then he came over with Hugh to uh, New York. Roger was a real railroad man. He had Bernard and uh, he had Bernard and a little girl, right? He had Bernard and Kathleen. Kathleen. Bernard is an accountant and has his own firm in uh, New Jersey. Kathleen married a schoolmaster. And uh, they live in outskirts of New York somewhere. Then came Brian. Then came your brother Brian. Then came Brian. Who did he marry? Well, he married a Dublin girl. And they had uh, three boys and a girl. The girl died. Now that's Tony in the middle there, right? Yeah. Tony in the middle and Brian to his left and Charlie. Charlie to his right. Uh -huh. Their mother's died too. We used to correspond with the boys when we were young. This is a picture of um, Tony and his wife Grace, Grace, right? Grace, I think before they were married. And um, I visited them in London when I was over there in 1956. They were both single at the time. She had just uh, graduated as a nurse. And he was working in England. Very nice girl. Tony was one of the uh, few Irish cousins that I met. 
Yeah, yeah. remember uh, you and I That's met true. him at the airport? That's true. And uh, it was like a little leprechaun by that time. <laughs> that was, uh, that Who's was, that? Uh, how many years ago we met Tony? Uh, I don't know. Ten? You know, it, it'd be wonderful to take uh, data of all these things. <laughs> yeah, it was a good think of it at the time. Right. Who's this? That's Kathleen. Well, after uh, after Brian came who? In your family? I uh, Seamus, which is Gaelic for James. And uh, he also died, didn't he? He, he also died. Well, he is Jim. Seamus was a very smart boy. Exceptionally smart. So he was sent to school. And at that time over there, Schools were segregated. That's a Catholic and Protestant. Still are. A Catholic could not get a job in a Protestant school, naturally. They, the Catholics wouldn't hire a Protestant. So the clergy had the full say in where you went to school if you wanted to be a teacher. And uh, there was a good, excellent college in Belfast where he could have come home in the evenings, you know, day certain, but that did, the clergy wouldn't allow them to go there. And of course they had the whole thing of where you taught and if you taught. And the only place you could be employed was the Catholic school. Well, where did they want him to go to school? He had to go to a place outside London called Strawberry Hill, where uh, Jesuits or some uh, uh, order had a school there to train teachers. So of course that made it more expensive for my parents. Well that that was about the time that my uh, brother Hugh was killed in uh, New York and they got a settlement from Hugh, from Hugh's death. And that settlement helped to educate Shivers. Oh he did go to Strawberry Hill? Oh he had to. If he wanted to teach the Catholic school, he had I to go see. to a Catholic institution. So he did go? So oh, yeah. He went there and he became a teacher. Uh -huh. And he came home and taught in Belfast, the Catholic school, for quite a few years. What caused his death? Pardon? What caused his death? Pneumonia. Oh, he died of pneumonia. At that time, they could do nothing for pneumonia. It was almost a death sentence uh -huh. to get pneumonia. Terrible. Again, Today, it's a very simple thing to get you through. The he never married, eh? He was engaged to be married when he died. Is that right? After Seamus. I think that was the end of the boys. Talked about Brian, didn't we? Yeah. After Seamus came Kathleen. Is this Kathleen's family here? That's Kathleen. And that's her husband, Jerry, and her four daughters. You met one of those daughters, you met Roisin. Yeah, we visited with Roisin uh, and her husband, John, not too long ago. Which one's Roisin? You don't know how, which one Roisin is, do you? She was at Brian Kors uh, not too long ago with her That's husband. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, they came over here to attend some convention in connection with this. Profession. What happened to Jerry? Well, Jerry was a fruit importer. Had a large uh, place down in the market area. Fruit came in from all over the world and then was trucked out to the different fruit stores in the city. He went out one evening outside the city to interview a fellow that uh, 
always had early tomatoes. He made a, an agreement with this man that he would keep all his tomatoes for Jerry. They came in early in the spring when prices were higher. He was coming home and two cars Are you still recording? Two cars pushed him into the side of the road. He was surprised, opened the door, see what was wrong. They pulled him out of the car and beat him up, threw him on the road, and one of the cars ran over him. It was generally known that this was because he was a Catholic and was connected in some way with the IRA. He probably wasn't, was he? He wasn't. Uh, his wife said he was not connected with the IRA, but had help with maybe in some little ways. He was hurt so badly that he's been in an institution ever since. Is he still alive? Still alive, but useless. After, uh, after, uh, after Kathleen came, Rita, Rita. This picture, Rita was taking lessons in Irish dancing. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> uh -huh. Wasn't she a good Irish dancer? Rita came out to this country uh, shortly after you, or what? We were living in Cuyahoga Street when she came out. She didn't like New York and came out to Detroit. She had married and her husband followed her out here. And uh, they had two boys and a girl. Tom died of, Tom, her eldest son died of a uh, brain tumor. Brian, the next boy, married a very nice girl from Beverly Hills. Suburb of Detroit. They now live in Broomfield Hills and they have one son, Sean. Sean graduated from college about two years ago. This being and this being a, this being the fall of nineteen ninety. This being the fall of nineteen ninety? Yeah. Very nice boy. After uh, Rita came, after Rita came Rosaline. Rosaline. Do we we don't have a picture of her? Do we? Rosaline. Yeah, Rosaline was a very uh, smart girl. Uh, my mother and father wanted her to be a teacher, but uh, she didn't. Uh, wanted to be a teacher. She wanted to be a nurse. So she trained to be a nurse in the city hospital. There was a Catholic hospital there called Mater Informora, which is a Latin, and Our Lady of Mercy. But she went to the city hospital to train and uh, graduated as a nurse. The city hospital couldn't uh, engage her after she graduated because there was too many applicants for the jobs that they had. 
she applied at Our Lady of Mercy, and uh, they wouldn't hire her because she didn't train there. They also had more applicants than they could hire. So I had accidentally met the matron of a London hospital when I was booking my passage to go over to Ireland. Just met her accidentally in the uh, booking office and we got talking and she told me that she was the matron of a hospital in London and she was over here observing American methods. So I invited her over for dinner and uh, she didn't know her way around the city but my husband and I went over on Sunday, after, uh, Sunday afternoon and brought her over and we had dinner together. We brought her back again to her hotel. So when Rosalind was having a hard time getting a nursing job, I wrote to this woman in London and she wrote back and said to tell my sister to come over right away that she had a job for her. So she, Rosalind spent her nursing years in London. And uh, she married an Irishman over there and had uh, three girls and a boy. What was his name? Shields. Well, that's the Shields uh, branch of the family. So the boy, Michael, became a physicist. And he is now living and working in uh, California. San Jose? Good job in California. I think he's in San Jose, right? He's near San Jose. Uh -huh. Just escapes me the little time that he lives in. But he's supposed to be doing very well there. Who came after Rosaline? That was the end of it. What about Sister Lucian? <laughs> we skipped her. Where does she fit in? She came in. When I said Kathleen came after Seamus, it was Lucian that came after Seamus. That's her religious name, her name and religion. Her baptismal name was Leticia. That's that's an excellent picture of uh, the two of them there, Rita and uh, yeah. Sister Lucian. Well, that was taken in Pittsburgh. So Sister Lucian is actually older than Rita. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was the first girl. There was four boys between me and she. Oh, she was the first of the band, a batch of girls. Yeah. And she just recently passed away. She died recently. She fell down a flight of steps. Wow. In, the, in the uh, convent. She died as a result, as a result of it. Now, um, you say that Pop's family lived kind of like downtown Belfast. Whose family? John your father, Hamill's your father. father. Yes. He lived downtown Belfast. How about your family? What part of My town? My family always lived on the outskirts. On the outskirts always. of town. What were some of the roads there? What were some of the roads? The old park road? Yeah. Was that the road that headed out toward your house? From yeah. downtown, the old yeah. park road. We lived at the end, at the end of it's not the end now, but built, built itself. But at that time, it was the end of the old park road way up near the mark. Was there a trolley? Uh, yeah. What was the name of the stop that you got off? Cliftonville Road. Cliftonville Road and Old Park Road was right around where you lived. They came to a point. Both roads came to a point from different directions. And that was around. That the was the area. That, time. that was the area you lived in. Eh? Cliftonville and uh, Old nice Park Road. Open area. In those days it was country. I yeah, was country. The first, is it recording? Yeah. The first uh, Catholic church in Belfast was St. Mary's and it was downtown. 
At that time, it's an old, old church. At that time, downtown was, you know, wasn't well populated. And the first priest appointed to that parish was Father O'Hamo. Is that right? O'Hamo. Do you think he was uh, a relative? Pardon? Was he a relative, you think? Well, your dad researched that, you know, but didn't get uh, too far with it. But uh, St. Mary's Church years and years and years later. Sponsored a dance every Sunday night to get the young Catholic people together and have something for them to do, you know. And uh, one evening a girl that I knew asked me if I'd like to go to St. Mary's Hall to this dance. And I said, well, I haven't been going to the dances. They're all Irish dances, and I don't know them very well. And she said, well, they'll teach you. So I went to the dance with this uh, Anne O'Connor. That's Mrs. McVeigh. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first time I met your father. So... A dashing young... A dashing, dashing young... 18-year-old. 18 18-year-old. We were both 18 years old. And uh, I liked him because he asked me to dance a lot. I never missed a dance. And uh, I began to like it. Anne and I went to the St. Mary's Hall every Sunday night. And I'd see your dad there every Sunday night. You know, it was a casual, you know, thing for years. But. Uh, Finally ended up that we went out together and didn't pay much attention to it. You know. I was young and I had, uh, I don't know, this might seem funny, but I had made up my mind that I would marry until I was 25 years old. At the time you were 18, were you thinking of going to the United States? No. I never thought of coming to the United States until I was chased from my work because I was Catholic. Yeah. Never. But your uncle Harry Hamill had come out here, and your dad told me about him coming out here, and that he was writing home and telling your dad how wonderful things were here compared to the conditions in Belfast. So he said that he might, uh, his mother and father wasn't too keen about it, but he had a notion that he would join his brother in New York, which he did some years later. So that was all right. Your dad started writing to me, and uh, but I never entered my mind that I would come out here and join him or anything like that. I wasn't that serious about it, but I don't think he was that serious about me. I don't know. But uh, when I was just for my work, I tried three other places in Belfast, and they wouldn't hire me because I had gone to the wrong school. Which meant you were Catholic. Yeah which proved I was a cat. So I was rather depressed. The only job I could get was working in Woolworths. I didn't like it. The money wasn't bad, but I didn't like the job at all. So finally I was telling your dad about this, you know, in the correspondence, and he said, why are you staying around that place? Why don't you come out here? Nobody will ask, it's against the law out here for anybody to ask your religion in uh, connection with the job. Well, I thought it wasn't bad advice. So I finally decided I'd apply for a passport and come out here. There was lots of opportunities and so on out here compared to there. So I did, I came out here. Well, I got my passport, got a visa from the American Council, Consul, and then went to the shipping office and 
put the passage out here. At that time, the big boats didn't come to Belfast. You had to take a small boat over to England and board the large boat out there. Well, that was a miserable night going across. The girl in the same cabin with me was sick and I was sick. And we sat on chairs out on deck all night because every time we entered the cabin, we got sick. <laughs> what year was this roughly? 1920. 1920. And uh, we sat out on uh, chairs on the deck all night. And there was a bunch of men out there talking when we decided to stay there all night because there was no use in going back in the cabin again. We woke up, I guess, about five or six in the morning and there was three or four men's overcoats over us. <laughs> now, isn't that something today? Yeah. When we woke up in the morning. It was, this was in November. Is that right? End of November. Is it the Irish Sea that's between, uh, is it the Irish Sea that's between Ireland and England? Yeah. It was pretty cold in very, November. Very, very rough and very cold. Yeah. All right, we got into Liverpool. And uh, we were examined. We had to have... Uh, Vaccinations? What do they call it? Chicken pox or something? Yeah. Immunization shots? Vaccination shots. We had to have those done in Belfast before we ever left there. But they examined to make sure you had them done, and at that time there was a scab on top. The girl in front of me, he uh, was a little bit rough when he pushed up her sleeve and he took the scab off. She was sent to another point to have something done about this. So he was, he was gentle with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I got through that all right. This was in the large boat in England. In, uh, yeah, in England. And the uh, voyage was good. There was a lot of girls my own age, and I got being friendly with them and so on and so forth. I had a nice voyage. Now, a girl, I don't know if it's the same today as it was then, I think it is. A girl cannot walk off the boat like a boy can. She has to be claimed by a female. She has to be claimed by a woman. I didn't know any woman. Her dad got his landlady, the woman that he rented a room from, Mrs. O'Gara. He got her to come and claim me. The boat was in a hurry back. There was what, at that time, there was what they called the quota system. So many got out inside a certain time. And the boat was in a hurry to get back to get another load up before the quota would expire. And we were pushed off the boat. Well, Mr. O'Gara hadn't arrived to get me off. And there was lots few other girls in the same position and we were taken over to Ellis Island. Instead of coming to the docks and getting me off there, she had to come to Ellis Island. Well, at that time, Ellis Island was a disgrace. A proper disgrace. And uh, so that delayed her, that confusion delayed her coming. And I had to spend the night and the day there on Ellis Island, which was not nice at all. We were called in for something to eat. And this was a great big long table, a long hall with tables, tables all over the place. Well, you filed in so many at a time, there was a young man on the door and he let so many in at the time fill the place and then the others had to wait until that sitting was over and so on and so forth. On these tables was a thick mug without a handle. <laughs> As you went down to the aisle to form into your table, there was great big barrels with loaves cut in chunks. As you passed the barrel, you lifted a chunk of a loaf 
and then filed into your place. Then a man comes around with a big pitcher and he fills these mugs with coffee. I looked at the hunk of bread and the coffee and I couldn't, I couldn't think of drinking or eating. Two of the girls that I knew were sitting nearby and they went into a fit of laughing which ended up in hysterics. It was like being in prison, eh? Well, I didn't eat, I didn't drink. We got so long to eat, and then you had to get out. So we got out, and this young man at the door said to me, did you eat anything? And I shook my head and said, no. Well, about a couple of hours later, he come up to me where we were sitting, around talking and wondering when we'd get out of there, and he handed me a bag, and I looked at him, you know, I opened the bag and there was six beautiful big apples in that bag. So two other girls and I finished going now. Yeah. So you were on it? Yes. I, oh, I, you heard your name called. I heard my name called, you know, to do a thing like that. I only knew one Catholic girl there. Um, she was from Belfast. She should be here. Well, and, and she, uh, well, she wasn't a very reliable who? Can you step in there. Who was your bridesmaid? Tell the her camera was, where we are now, what she is, and all that. Ellie O'Gorman. I met her in New York. You never met her. I'm afraid to. Uh, well, tell me it's from Italy. Italy. She wasn't a very reliable character. Can a little closer? Yeah, that's good. Okay, here I'm leaning in as far as I can get. Uh, this is May the 27th, 1997, and this is Chapter 2 of the saga of Anne and John Hamill and their descendants. At all. At all. Right. Okay, carry on. What's <laughs> that, the introduction? That's yeah, the introduction, yeah. yes. Well, go ahead about the wedding. Where was the yeah, wedding? Where's that wedding? Well, just what make it short then. What church were you married in, in Anne? What church were you married in in Brooklyn? St. Edwards. Where Brooklyn, was Brooklyn, New York. Where was that about in Brooklyn? I'm not St. Edwards. Is? See, I can't hear. Where was St. Edwards? Where in Brooklyn? Well, the name of the church, uh, the street was Church Street. Jerk Street. Church. 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 Oh, church. church. <laughs> Apropos. Mm -hmm. And uh, John's brother was in Ireland at the time. And he had a friend of theirs, Charlie McStalker, who was the best man. I didn't know any Catholic girls. I wasn't it really was certainly been my president. The priest told me afterwards that. that he could have gotten somebody to stand up for you. It doesn't matter who's standing up for you, as long as they're Catholic. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I had asked Miss Ellie O'Gorman, who was from Belfast, the only Catholic girl that I knew. And there. So she wasn't a very reliable character, but I thought this is the only Catholic girl I know. <laughs> she fell on the way up to the church. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> she tripped on something, but Ellie would trip over her own feet, you know. You sure God wasn't trying to tell you something? <laughs> but uh, that was how she wasn't hurt. But uh, the wedding went all right. It was okay. But there was, no, there was nobody else in the church. We didn't know anybody. But I was. Uh, living with a Mr. and Mrs. Harrington. And uh, times were good at that time. And uh, he had worked with John, and that's how we met them. And uh, he got a book that sailed to South America or somewhere you know, for work. He worked on a boat. He had a wife and child, you know. And uh, Jack wasn't laid off, but he was laid off. And uh, he was on a boat trip to uh, South America, working with the engines, you know, keeping the thing going. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Harrington said that she'd make the breakfast, you know. Now, I would have had Mrs. Harrington for red maid, but she had this infant. You know, she couldn't leave him. And so, uh, anyway, yeah. But uh, 
We had Ellie's mother there, a very nice woman. And uh, Mrs. Zang put up a good breakfast, nice breakfast. Well, after that, uh, I had written to an ad in the paper that were inviting uh, people to come and spend the vacation with them, you know, the commercial thing. And uh, I saw this uh, ad in the paper uh, two or three weeks before I was going to be married, so I wrote to them. And I got a very nice letter back, and uh, it was going to cost us ten dollars a week. <laughs> Where? So. <coughs> after the breakfast, we left. We got a boat up the Hudson, two one of those uh, places up the Hudson, or way up the Hudson River. And these people met us where we got off the boat and took us to the place. Their daughter had been a cook in a hotel in uh, Albany, and she was home for some weeks and she was the cook. And the, the, the food there was just delicious, marvelous. And they thought I was too thin, and they left a pitcher of water, of uh, milk, in the bedroom table, and I was supposed to drink that between meals. <laughs> Put on weight. <laughs> So I did, I drank it. I didn't put on a little weight. But it was very, very nice and very comfortable. Uh, we, we went back there the, a year from then. We took, Jack took a week off. We went back there. Uh, same results, very, very nice. Ten dollars a week. Ten bucks a week. Time to a time to a bad. That was in the Catskills, Aunt Ann? Up, in the Catskills, upstate New York? Was it in the Catskill Mountains? Yeah, Catskill Mountains. Where was Father working at this time? Where was he working? Yes. He was working in uh, a place downtown where they made newspaper machinery. And they also repaired uh, machinery. So uh, that's what he always worked at, machine repair, machine building. Yeah. And where were you working? Me? Did somebody ask me yes. where I was working? Yes. Well, I was working. I didn't have a job. Uh, before I was married, I was taking care of an old lady on Riverside Drive, a millionaire. And uh, she had been in the paralyzed since her son was born. And her son was 20 years, 21 years old. When I hired with them. And, uh, uh, it, was, it wasn't easy work. We were on your feet all day long, and uh, you had to feed her, bathe her, you had to do everything for her. And uh, sometimes a little bit ratchety when anything on her mind, she think it was not. But uh, the principal uh, trouble that we had with her was Jack would come over to meet me on my night off at 7.30. I was supposed to get off at 7.30. And I would see him down on Riverside Drive walking around, and she'd think of a lot of little pretty things for me to do at 7.30. And I wouldn't get out of there till a quarter to eight, you know, or maybe 10 minutes to eight, so I got fed up with that. So one night uh, he said to me, uh, don't you talk to her about this, that they're supposed to get off at 7.30. I said I didn't, and she huffed and puffed and thought I was uh, taking advantage of her. So he says, well, why don't you put the damn thing? So, <laughs> when I told her, I said, I think I will. And when I told her, I gave her, I, what's the notice I gave her? It was going to be hard for her to hire somebody, because she was a little bit difficult to work with. Uh, I think I gave her two weeks notice or something. Anyway, when I told her that I was leaving, and of course the excuse, the excuse I gave her was that I was going to be married and leave New York. So her sister was the housekeeper there, and when the sister came into the room, she, she says, Ann, just give me a notice, and she says, what? Her name was Miss Kitty. So uh, Miss Kitty was the boss, and so she says, what are you leaving for? I, I said, well, I'm going to get married, and we're going to leave, but in New York, we're going to Detroit. So they couldn't say and do anything about that. So I left. 
And that we decided to get married right away. We did. When you well, came back from your honeymoon, where did you live? We, uh, John was living with Mrs. O'Gara, Mr. and Mrs. O'Gara. And uh, then uh, he, he was working with this man, with Jim Harrington. And Jim was la laid off, and he got this boat to go down South America just to get to have a paycheck. And uh, your dad was still working. And uh, and Mrs. Harrington said to, uh, to your dad, why don't we have an extra room here? Why doesn't your uh, girlfriend come and live with me until you get married, you know, and all that sort of thing. So when I left the Riverside Drive job, I went over to Harrington. I knew it was Mrs. Harrington, a woman of my age, you know, with 25 or 26 years old, with a small child. You know, and it was just wonderful. After the Riverside Drive, it was great. She was a very nice person. She'd been a nurse, but she wasn't working anymore. So, uh, we got married from there, and she made the breakfast, and she was very, very nice. And then uh, Mr. Harden, we lived there with her until Mr. Harden came home. So uh, we had a, an apartment in my and when he came home, so we moved into our own apartment. That was the end of the marriage. Well, not the end of the marriage, but it was the end of some. <laughs> Ask her how they came Very quiet. About coming to Detroit. Well, how did you uh, decide to come to Detroit? How did you, what was the decision to come to Detroit? We, we were not coming to Detroit at that time. I just said that to her. So oh, I see. To leave but you eventually did we come to Detroit. Detroit. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, you went back to Ireland. Yeah. Oh, and that just went back to start the chicken farm. I wasn't enthusiastic about a chicken farm because I didn't think Jack would ever be a chicken farmer. <laughs> but anyway, he had it on the brain, and he, all he talked about. And I thought, well, we'll have a big row if I don't go back with him. I had a notion to say, you go back and see if you can start a chicken farm and I'll work here. And if your chicken farm's a, a success, I'll go home. But I knew it wouldn't be a success. But that he wouldn't have agreed with that. That was just a thought I had, but I didn't put it in action because I do it. I wouldn't agree with it. Everybody would think we were separated or something. But uh, I decided to go along with them. We were young enough, and if we didn't make a mistake, what the heck, we could start over again and not argue or fight about it. So this apartment that we uh, rented after we were married, uh, I was coming home from work one day, and I saw this big van loading furniture. And I went over, and there was a black man there, and I said, are these people moving out or moving in? He said, they're moving out. Oh, I said, do you know who's the manager? He says, I am. <laughs> so I said, what does it rent for? He says, $40 a month. So times were bad to rent for $40 a month? That was cheap. We had three bedrooms, and we bought a big, uh, we bought a big uh, couch that turned out made a bed, and the living room, big living room, rooms were pretty large. So we moved in there, bought furniture, and uh, had it pretty well furnished. Then these guys started coming out. Our Hugh was in Montreal, and he he came from Montreal down to New York, and uh, Jack's two cousins came out from Belfast. So we had three boarders. There was we, David, huh? David, and Tommy. David Tommy. And Tommy. And Tommy. And we had three boarders. So we decided then uh, to go back to Belfast, back to Ireland, and start this chicken farm. And he was getting uh, a literature from this chicken farm all the time. And he'd have to buy a brooder, and he'd have to buy a, a, a thing that they were hatched at. What's the name? Incubator. Of? Yeah. So, but he would have to do that home, at home. So, we just decided that I would run the house on the borders, what they gave me, and I was still working in this little extra place. 
I could walk it because it wasn't far. We had walk to it every day. Well, I worked there, bought groceries on the way home, and cooked for five people every day. And they paid me $40 a month at three boarders. And with what I earned, I was able to run the house and pay all the bills with what I was earning. Your dad put that money in the bank for the chicken farm. Who cleaned up the kitchen after dinner? Mother? Who cleaned up the kitchen after dinner? I just... I'll tell you a funny story about that later. But anyway, uh, you got all right. I felt good. And they were getting along all right. He was saving his money. Jack wasn't spending his money. He just what he needed. And I knew that. But, uh... How long did it take? How long did it take? To How long did it take to save enough money to go back? Maybe a year. Was Sheila Boyne here or over there? And then, the, you know this. Over there? Yeah. Well, the, the boarders had to work, you know. They stayed a week after I left for Ireland. There was a girl there that had a child illegitimately. She was from uh, north of Ireland, but she wasn't Catholic. She made a mistake about this child, a beautiful child. Lovely little girl, remember Peggy? Little Peggy. <laughs> so, she's a non oh, yeah. She's working in a big house, and the lady sees her that she's going to have a child, and she called her to have a serious talk. So she said, Well, the Lord's what are you going to do? Well, she said, I don't want to do it. So, this was. Uh, a lady of consequence, and she uh, inquired around, and she found a place for Elizabeth to go in, you know, before the child was born, have the child there, and stay there for a week or two to come to her help, and, but then she'd have to get out. So, I didn't know her very well. I was just introduced to her. I didn't know her very well. But she came over to see me one day, there was nobody there, but I think it was on a Sunday, and, uh, I think Jack had some friends in the front. It was a long apartment. It was long. And when he went in, he went to the living room and then he went to past the dining room, bathroom, and bedroom. And he got to the kitchen, was at the back. So Elizabeth and I had a talk in the back, and she had heard that we were thinking of going back home. And would I take the child to her mother, who lived outside Bangor? little seaside place up Belfast. So I said, well, I'd have to ask you all about that. I couldn't just give you a yes or no answer now. But I said, I'll talk it over with my husband now that you know. So we talked over with him and we both felt sorry for she couldn't get a job with this child. She was in desperate condition. We felt sorry for her. So finally she came back again and I said, yeah, I'll take her home. I said, do you have a letter from your husband, your uh, mother, uh, telling us that uh, the child is welcome over there? And she said, yes, I have. I'll show it to you. I haven't it with me, but I'll show it to you. So I took her word for that. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, I took Peggy home, and she was no trouble at all. How she old? She was a year and a half old at that time, and she was toddling, you know, and uh, that was a beautiful child. But anyway, the child went to anybody. She made no difference to people. That child would go to anybody. And she, she was no bother at all, but you had to watch her. You couldn't take your eyes off her if you're up on the deck. Because, you know, here was all this water. Yeah, <laughs> so they don't stop it wasn't an easy job to watch that kid all the time and bathe her and take care of her and clothe her and all. But anyway, I had said I'd do it and I just well, I got home, but Lilith hadn't given me her mother's address. <laughs> and my mother was all her children. She said, if they don't pick her up, we'll keep her. <laughs> wow. After raising 11 children, they wanted to keep her. And, uh, but anyway, I had to go downtown to sign a paper. I don't know what was trying to think about that. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I had to go downtown this day. We were home about two weeks. And nobody had ever come for Peggy. And uh, we weren't worried about that. 
nobody was worrying about who was going to keep her. So nobody claimed her. But anyway, I had another time that day. I had to go to sign a paper. And when I came back, my mother says, well, those people came and picked up Peggy. I said, who came? She says, oh, the girl's mother and her sister, one of the sisters, and they had taken Peggy. Well, I said, that was okay. That was okay. At the end of that, and my mother made them a cup of tea, you know, something. And packed her, she had a little bag, packed her little bag, and away she went. So um, we, I never saw little Peggy after that, but uh, I never got another letter from Peggy's mother in this country. She got a job, she's working. And uh, after I was in, uh, up in Balmash where your dad's mother and father lived, we were living with uh, his father and mother. I got a letter from the mother of this child. And she was taking me to task all over the place with some bits of crude language because I wasn't there when her mother and sisters came to take Peggy. I wasn't looking after Peggy. I wasn't even there. I can you meet me? You want to do a good turn and this is what you get for it. I never answered the letter. Never answered. Years and years later when I'm living in Cuba Street, I get a letter from her. And she had a girlfriend that I called Marion. I didn't know Marion very well. But she wanted to tell me that Marion had got married and had a child. And uh, they were entertaining uh, friends from New Jersey. At that time, and I suppose still, you can get a boat over to New Jersey. You, you can take other transportation, but the boat was popular in the summertime. So when the friends were leaving, they all went down to the boat to see them off. And uh, Marion's little girl was uh, two years, two or three years old, and she was waiting for the boat to the get to open so they get in the boat, and all stand there talking, you know other people around. When the visitors wanted to leave and wanted to say goodbye to the little girl, they couldn't find her. Couldn't find her. And there was a big uproar. Even the boat was held up. They got divers to go down in the water and see they could, nobody could find her. Now somebody walked away with that kid when they weren't watching. Well, if she had included Marion's address, I would have written to Marion, but she didn't. She didn't give me Marion's address. I never answered that letter. She never said what happened to Peggy? I never knew. I thought you told me that Peggy eventually came back. Did Peggy ever return to this country? Yes. Somebody told your dad that they were down in Fulton Street, which is the principal shopping uh, part of Brooklyn, New York. And they met Elizabeth and this girl. This girl was 12 or 13 years old at the time. And that she had gone, she got married, and she'd gone over and picked up Elizabeth from her taxi. That's the only reason I know she came back. But I never, I, I didn't want that, I didn't want anything more to do with that girl. So carry on about the chicken farm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask her, did Peggy look like any of the family? Well, <laughs> about the chicken farm. You have to buy eggs, and the eggs had to be candled, candled as it said. They were expected to be sure that a chicken would uh, be a result of that egg, you know. So uh, he went through all that. Got these eggs. Incubator. That's what you call a thing with a hatch and an incubator. Well, when I saw where the hamels were living, I thought this is another drawback. That will never be a chicken bar. As we up in the hill. And it was hard for a horse to get up there. And uh, I thought this is a terrible place. It should be down and, uh, and I thought to myself, he's going to have to have transportation, you know, to if he's going to sell eggs or chickens, you know, and that's what it mean, a horse or a pony or something. 
She had never driven a horse in Slavery. <laughs> yeah. He was a one step at a time guy. No longer. All that probably get some tickets. <laughs> oh, that I thought while we were on vacation, <laughs> I uh, was supposed to have an operation, which wasn't in any hurry. I could wait and wait for that, but I thought it was a good time in Belfast. He was a top-notch doctor on that particular uh, case, and uh, he'd been knighted by the Queen. His, his mother had died when he was born, and uh, he decided he'd, de he'd devote his whole life to women women's struggles. So I thought, well, at well, that moment with a, an operation, I had met a nurse in New York who was a veteran of a hospital room, and I uh, got talking to her, and uh, I told her, she asked me why I was so thin, and, uh, well, she says, you're eating, you had a good dinner then. I said, yes, I'm eating well, but I don't gain weight, I was 105 pounds. So, she says, you're worrying about something? I said, yeah. I've been married so long, and no children. My mother's 11 children, what's wrong with me? Look at this is. So uh, she says, uh, I'm going to solve that problem. I said, oh. well, she says, I did a favor in the hospital for Sir John, Sir John Campbell, and uh, he's a top-notch woman's man, and if anybody can help me either. I said, no, I've been told by Dr. Ear that this is not a big thing. It's an easy thing to fix. And that's all I need to have to. So uh, she says, you're going to you're gonna go to Sir John Campbell when you go to Belfast. So uh, during the time all this chicken thing was going on, I said to John one day, I said, I went up to Belfast to make an appointment with John Campbell, and I'm going to have an operation. So he says, well, take your time for a little while. I said, what for? I've been taking my time for two years and I'm fed up. <laughs> I just decided I was going to do what I wanted. He did what he wanted, but I was going to do what I wanted. But I went up there and I had the operation. And <clears throat> so I said, I Sir John Campbell, a little private hospital across the street from where he lived. Went over there on a Monday morning and was out on Friday. So, uh, <clears throat> sit at my mother's father's house until John come down. So that was that. Well, a few months later, Sheila was born. The result. She was born. So, well, that was fine. <laughs> that, and so did the testimonial. Brian, the operation on her birth didn't cost me one cent. Not one cent. There's a lot to be said for nationalized medicine. I got good attention, excellent attention. But uh, anyway, uh, he had bought an incubator, and he had bought eggs. And the only place, she didn't have any outdoor uh, building where he could uh, do this business, so he used her parlor. <laughs> really? <laughs> she tolerant. To candle the eggs? Or to have some pay on the parlor, which had belonged to the daughter who had died, and they wouldn't sell the piano because they had been the big long table in the parlor. So this incubator would sit on this table, and the incubator, the, uh, <coughs> the uh, eggs were put in there, you know, and they had to be attended also. So I said to him, now this is your business. You're the, you're the uh, chicken door, not me. I said, don't depend on me. I have a baby now. I'm in charge of the baby. I'm in charge of the chickens. <laughs> so this was all a very um, large interest to the people around there that had never seen an incubator. They didn't believe that eggs could be hatched by anybody but a hen. Oh, right. And they were coming up on Sunday afternoons to see the eggs that had no mother. She was charged. <laughs> The virgin eggs, <laughs> the virgin chicken. So anyway, the eggs were hatched and then he had this stuff. Uh, you have all these chickens running the around the living room? <laughs> they got the brooder and, uh, oh, and he put. fed them. Now where was the brooder? Where was the brooder? Was well, it? after the incubator was, uh, they finished the incubator when the things were hatched, 
They took it out and put the brooder in there. So the brooder was in the parlor? Yeah. <laughs> no outbuildings? No outbuildings? Chicken coops? They must have been. They burned down. It was a buyer. You know what a buyer is? is a, oh. no, what's a buyer? Cows? B Y E R, yeah. A buyer. It was a buyer yeah. for cows. But that was the place to uh, catch the chickens. chickens. Oh. So, go on. Anyway, uh, he bought this, uh, and, uh, not a incubator, but a brooder. Brooder. Mm -hmm. And it was to be kept at a certain mm -hmm. temperature while these chickens were little, <laughs> until they were two months old or something. So it was moved into the uh, car. And there was no electric heater in there. He had to buy a heater to a certain this thing. It was uh, fueled by oil, oh. powerful oil. So he was in charge of all that. I don't know. I wouldn't think anything to do with it. He was in charge. Well, uh, John was a great man for going to the city every once in a while, walking around. He liked to go to the city. And his father was still working in the city, and he'd come up at the weekend. So he'd go to the city maybe on a Thursday afternoon, spend Friday walking around, and then Friday night he'd come back with his father. So he decided this uh, weekend he was going to the city. So he told me on a Thursday morning he was going to the city. So the, there was a bus went from where we lived down to Belfast. So he was going to get the bus. So I said, well, uh, the chickens are going to need heat tonight. He says, yeah. He says, I'll uh, drive the heat before I go. Well, so that, and then he took me up and he showed me how to shut off the heat and all that. By this time, I can't So I said, well, I wouldn't start it, but I can shut it off. Mm -hmm. Where were they? They weren't in the parlor anymore. Were, were they still in the parlor? Yeah. The what? Were the... <laughs> Was the brooder still yeah. in the parlor? Okay. Oh, no, it wasn't. No, no, yeah. it wasn't. He, he had built a little place. He had built a little place outside, okay. further up the hill. He had built a little place for the brooder. And he started the brooder before he left. And he had showed me how to turn it off and all that. Sure. He was only going to be away for a day, you know. So, about. Uh, an hour or so after he started the brew. He was outdoors and his mother was outdoors and I was in the house. And the dog came barking at the back door. Now if anybody was coming that the dog didn't know he would bark his head off. If somebody knew he wouldn't bark at all. So he was barking his head off and I thought somebody's coming that we don't know he doesn't know. I heard the back door and when I opened the back door, the flames, I could see the flames of nothing.